Good morning, if it pleases the court, Mr. Molinar. My name is Chris Brown. I represent the appellant, the Surety Bow Bail Bonds Corporation. Um, I just would like to add at the outset, it's uh, always a pleasure and an honor to appear before the court, especially such a distinguished panel as we have today. If it sounds in part as if I'm flattering the court, it's probably because I'm admittedly standing here with a much weaker legal position than my opponent, Mr. Molinar, um, for the Collier County Clerk. Um, I did want to start before going into our argument for reversal of the trial court's decision by, by going into the, the history of how um, Mr. Redding, that would be Bo from Bo Bail Bonds, ended up in the position that he was in. Um, this is reflected in part in the transcript of the hearing below, as well as the motions and pleadings in the, uh, in the record uh, with the attachments, some correspondence with the clerk's lawyers, as well as the state attorney's office. Um, the defendant in the underlying case, Mr. Cypress, was out on bond for $25,000 posted by Bo Bail Bonds. Mr. Cypress went and got himself arrested in, I believe, St. Lucie County, if I recall. His arrest actually predated his failure to appear, which occurred on September 15, 2017, in Collier Circuit Court. Um, so he was already in custody uh, in another county, which is important under 903.26. When he failed to appear, the clerk automatically generated a notice of forfeiture to the bail bonds company, and uh, that was generated per statute, and this is one of the issues I have to contend with. The statute says uh, the generation of the signature and the date of the signature on the certificate of service constitutes proof that mailing occurred that day. And that was one of the arguments below that it was highly... Electronically. It's done electronically in this case, right? Right. That was one of twofold argument below, which is the elect, does the electronic signature c constitute an actual certi certification of a clerk that she's mailing this and notice? There's a statute right on point that says it does. Yes. And number two, well, the statute, I believe, says that the the cert certification of the clerk that it's being mailed constitutes proof that it actually was mailed that day. The other argument that made below was that it was highly unlikely that it did go out that day because of the fact that the appearance, the failure to appear, and this is reflected in the record as well, occurred in the afternoon docket of a busy case management docket so that it may have generated a notice when the clerk noted the failure to appear in the estreature of the bond by the trial judge, but the likelihood just from a well, you've got two statutes you're running under, the, the 903.26 and 903.28. And also 903.27, which, okay. which talks about proper notice as well. So they, they kind of, you have, I, I would argue, I'd have to read them kind of in peri materia. And I think that's what Judge Hart tried to do below, uh, who, 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 if you read the record, was somewhat sympathetic, was even asking me for, to give him reasons for excusable neglect. But, you know, we didn't want to be disingenuous about that. What happened was the notice went out and the record does reflect a relationship between the surety and the clerk's office in that there was a reminder given by Ms. Lorraine Stahl to Mr. Redding that, you know, there is this forfeiture due, don't forget, because he's a local bondsman that they're familiar with. Um, Mr. Redding, and this isn't in the record, but I can only surmise for logic's sake, must have had the number 15 in his head because he pays it on the 15th of November. Unfortunately for him, October has 31 days, not 30. So that made it the 61st day. So we have here a bond company that was entitled to a discharge of the bail under 90326 if he'd had gotten a hearing in front of the judge within 60 days without even paying it. Because there's absolute proof and it's uncontested that Mr. Cypress was in custody. But, but he didn't. He didn't. And we were, it wasn't able to get in I front mean, of... I mean, 61 seems like uh, unfortunate, but... You can't order uh, remission for any reason other than uh, specified <coughs> in the statute. So you're out of luck under under 903.26, apparently. It, it, it there's no equitable powers to change the, the law. Well, it would seem so, and I, I don't want to use the word equity because I think all the way back in law school I was told never to use that word in front of an appellate Unless court. Unless you would take an equity. I, I, may <laughs> say, I may say that the situation seems awful and equitable. <laughs> I would use that term. So what happens here is... During the 60-day period, the record reflects there are attempts to get the clerk to stipulate to a simple discharge before it goes, before the remission is paid, or the forfeiture is paid, pardon me, um, and that the clerk declines to do so based on some discussions regarding whether or not the, the booking uh, information from the St. Lucie Jail constituted sufficient proof that Mr. Cypress was in custody. Um, at that point, the 
the surety is whipsawed between the two statutes in that if you're trying to stipulate and you can't get it done in time, it's unlikely in a busy circuit court judges you can get a hearing and a ruling within 60 days. So the instruction then to the surety, to my client, was pay, pay the forfeiture, we will seek remission, because we have proof the man is in custody. There's no doubt, and there's never been a doubt about that question. So the bond system is working. This man has been recaptured actually before it even, <laughs> he even failed to appear. Um, so the argument of the clerk, and, and this is where we argue on the statute, the, the, earth, the clerk's argument is a hyper-technical one to say, yes, there's no doubt this person was in custody. Yes, there's no doubt that bow bail bonds would be re entitled to 100% remission. There's no doubt they paid us the $25,000. However, if, if notice had been mailed on September 15th and they paid it on 1 p.m. on uh, November 16th, they paid it a few hours late and therefore we should be entitled to be enriched to the sum of $25,000 even though this person was in custody the entire time and he would have been able he would have been entitled to 100% remission if he paid it at 4.59 p.m. the afternoon before. So our argument is if the clerk is relying on a higher te technical application of the statute, and we argued this below, I believe it was preserved, number one, it, it, it says it constitutes sufficient proof of mailing that, that there's a certificate. It does not ever say that that's not a rebuttable presumption, and we did question the clerk below, do you know that it was actually placed in the mail? Considering it was generated sometime that afternoon, was it av actually given to a postal carrier and put into the mail system? A and they, their answer was they, could, they couldn't they could know that or they didn't really have a response to that. They wouldn't know how to well, respond. But doesn't the statute say sh it shall constitute? The minute they say what they did, it shall constitute, then the burden would shift to the other side to show something different as opposed to questioning whether they comply with the statute. Right, well our questioning of them was then trying to rebut that what, what, what for lack of a better term, since it doesn't say under no circumstances or this may not be rebutted, it appears, it has the appearance of rebuttable presumption. So our question was, do you have actual proof that it was placed in the mail or do you just know that it was an, an e-cig was generated? Uh, and secondly, that it appears that the statute says a, a, a notice of forfeiture accompanied by a certificate of the clerk. Whereas here we have one document that's simply a notice of forfeiture that it's got an e-signature stamped on it. And again, I realize this is a highly technical argument, but, but I ask the court to remember that uh, my opponent, respectfully, is arguing also a hyper-technical argument that on a few hours into day 61, with the defendant in custody, with a bail bond agent who's otherwise clearly entitled to 100% remission, should lose 100% of his money. Therefore, it's, it's it turnabout seems to be fair play for the appellant to argue well, let them, let, let's do a hyper-technical analysis of their process. They press a button, an e-signature is generated on the same form as the notice of forfeiture, and they cannot, they cannot state that that notice was actually mailed to the U.S. mail that day. It seems highly unlikely that it was, considering the time of the failure to appear. I, if, if we knew for a fact, which I would argue common sense would tell us, that it didn't get into the mail until at very least the next day, then he would have been in within the 60 days. Well, did, did Bo Bail Bonds attach any affidavits to its motion for remission? Um, he, I do not believe that we did have any affidavits attached to the motion for well, remission. There's no evidence to establish that the state's prosecution of Cyprus was not thwarted by the delay in him appearing. That is correct, although I don't think they attempted to make that argument, so I don't think that would be preserved by them on appeal. I think the, their argument is simply if you haven't paid within 60 days, you, you know, and, and I don't believe it was done in a mean-spirited way or anything, but just we don't want a slippery slope to occur here. If you're allowed to pay on day 61, somebody else will probably want to pay on si day 62. And, and I understand that would be a concern, and it would be a concern I would have sitting in their chair. But the facts of this case are, are I don't want to, sometimes the term sui generis is overused, but we have here a local bondsman who, pays a few hours late based on a mathematical error on his part where he's clearly entitled to the relief that he seeks. And under these particular facts, given that there's no actual proof that notice was mailed to him that day, when the clerk was questioned about whether this, she actually knows this was mailed that day, yes, it says there's a presumption created, but when questioned about it, um, we argue that Bo Bail Bonds rebutted that presumption by showing that they, they had no one that could actually say, yes, we know it got in the mail bef 
we have a letter carrier that comes by at 4 p.m. to get our notices every afternoon to make sure they're out on the actual day that we say they are. And that secondly, it wasn't strict compliance with the statute. It required a certificate indicating mailing and it required a notice of forfeiture. This was a notice of forfeiture of simply a signature saying, I attest that this is being mailed this day. And, and again, I, I realize I'm making a very nitpicky argument here, but the denial of the $25,000 remission to, to my client was based on just such an argument made below. And, and if the court has no more questions at this time, I'd like to reserve five right. minutes for rebuttal. Thank you very Thank much. You, Mr. Brown. Mr. Molinar. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Mr. Brown. My name is James Molinar. I represent Crystal Kinzel, who is now the clerk of the Circuit Court of Collier County. Prior to that, at the time of this occurrence, was Dwight Brock, who had passed away one year ago today. What we have before us, it was, as far as I can see, is a simple binary argument. Either the light is on or the light is off. Uh, either the answer is true or false. Either the substance is molten or it's frozen. In the particular case we have here, was the, was the surety, did they pay on time or were they late? And they were late. Does the statute create a presumption or does it say it shall constitute notice that of, of, of mailing? Well, what we have is we have um, the transcript, the record, and the transcript, the record on page 77, and I'll answer your question. Uh, we had the clerk, the deputy clerk, who was there in the courtroom. She typed in her name, and it says that it was sent out to the bail bondsman to the note at 2.44 p.m. on September 15, 2016. As far as I know, that's unrebutted. She also said, I think during her testimony, that she, was also, she created the document that that was then placed in the mail. The statute says that it can be placed in the mail or it can be electronically sent. And so in this case, electronically sent sort of certainly satisfies the notice requirement. So in fact, he did pay 60 days late, and that would be at 903-26, subsection 2A. And there is no other reason to discharge this. Everything else was, there's no other facts, there's no other evidence that really. Does the judge have discretion to ignore the statute? Absolutely. To the local bail bond? No, absolutely not. He's only given a few exceptions. If you look at uh, no, 903-26, the, you know, if he's in the, 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 the defendant's in the hospital, in jail, or in custody, or somewhere else, and none of that was ever placed in evidence or on the record. So there is absolutely no discretion in this particular case. Okay. Um, I really have nothing more for you. Uh, Mr. Brown did a nice job. Mike, I, I have one question because Mr. Brown in the brief argued or uh, he argued that notice has to be put it has to be mailed but the statute makes it either or or you could do both presumably. Right. So you your position is as long as they send it electronically and there is evidence of electronic transmission it doesn't matter if it was put in the mail or not. Correct, but I, I believe the record would show that, in fact, the, the deputy clerk who was there in the courtroom said both occurred. We are able to substantiate with the electronic record. She testified that at 2.44 p.m. On, on the 15th. We know, we know she entered the information, and we know she said that she printed it out. Did she confirm that it actually went in the mail that day, or she said her, the normal practice is print it, it goes out in the mail? Uh, I believe she said her normal practice is she completes it at the end of the day, goes out in the mail. And I don't have that exact quote in front of me, and I apologize for that, Your Honor. So with that, um, I would ask that you affirm the trial court's order, deny the appellate's request for a remission of 100% of the bond or any portion thereof. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Molina. Mr. Brown. Yes, thank you, sir. And, and just briefly in response to Judge Silverman's question, and I do not want to misquote the record, so if I'm incorrect about this, I apologize. Well, uh, first, uh, but do you agree that it's electronic or mail? Because I thought in your brief you had said they have to do two things. They have to do it electronically and they have to mail it. And the statute seems to say or. Then I may, then I may have misquoted the uh, the law in my brief, in which case I apologize. That's a serious error to make. I I, I would say, and, and again, I'm, I don't want to misquote the record, but I don't believe that the county established that an actual email, if that's what they would refer to as electronic delivery, went out to the bail agency that that very day like it typically would on e-service with an attorney, uh, you know, where a document's filed by the court that day or notice to appear, and then there's an e-delivery because you're on, a, you're on that um, delivery list. Sorry, 
brain fog. You're on that list of, of, of email addresses that you automatically receive the documents. I don't believe that, that they indicated that it was emailed to Bo Bail Bonds that day, but if I'm incorrect about that, I do apologize. Uh, but, it, but again, our argument here is, and I, and I have to be candid, is in part an equitable argument, um, but it's also a technical argument because that is the argument that they make. Um, that the notice itself is, in, is inadequate because it does not contain a separate certificate and that the presumption that it was either emailed out or mailed out that day had been rebutted by the cross-examination of the uh, deputy clerk. And if the court has no further questions, I thank you for your and, time. And just so you know, I may have read yes, too much into your statement on the brief, but what you said was it creates a duty for the surety to pay. However, it also imposes a duty on the clerk to place that notice in the U.S. mail on the date of the failure to appear and to file a signed certificate that it has done so. So I was interpreting that as you were saying that it was mandatorily required that it be mailed as well as electronic. And, and I do apologize. I, I probably should have qualified the statement, but I, but I believe what I meant by saying that is absent proof that it was electronically delivered to them that they would it would have to be mailed to them. Um, and, and in my experience, I don't want to speak outside the record, but having represented sureties before, that's usually how they receive notice is, is a letter, which is the document you see in the record. They just receive it in an envelope, letting them know your person wasn't here. Um, and if there are no further questions, I thank you all for your time this morning. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Council.